Good day chaps. So today's video is going to cover a controversial subject. This is the flaw of the German Panther tanks. And we're going to look at the faulty metals used on these German tanks in World War II that saw a large number suffering from extreme cracking and spalling after receiving hit. This video will be looking primarily at the metallurgical tests undertaken by the British, the Americans and the Canadians during the war, as well as the makeup of the German armour, particularly on the plates used by the German Panther. The tank that would become the Panther started back in 1938 as a project for a new medium tank to replace the Panzer III and Panzer IV when the time came. This resulted in the VK20 series with designs submitted by Mann, Krupp and Daimler-Benz. This became a 20-ton tank that reached the prototype stage but the project was stopped and the specifications changed to a 30-ton vehicle. Work began on a new design in 1941 between the German tank design departments and Mann and Daimler-Benz with the aim to have prototypes ready for May 1942. And of the two proposals, it was the MAN design that was accepted. Work from this project resulted in the VK3002, the first prototype Panther. The vehicle itself looked good on paper. A powerful anti-tank gun, well-sloped armour, and a good turn of speed. Yet it suffered initially from a lack of adequate testing, and with a rush to get many ready for the Kursk offensive, they'd suffered heavily from mechanical issues and breakdowns, commonplace with vehicles that have not been adequately tested to root out their flaws. But this video will be looking at two of the more uncommon problems of the Panther, one that also affected other German tanks, but none more so than this one, and that is the poor quality of the metal found in many examples, as well as the inherent flaws of sloped armour at the thickness it was, and why it's sloping actually may have helped enemy guns. These flaws would have made Panther somewhat of a liability, partially in combat, but more importantly in the aftermath where heavy damage done to the vehicle would make recovery and repairs much more difficult, especially when you're on the losing side with limited numbers of expensive tanks and the ability to recover and repair vehicles in a timely manner can be of utmost importance. So let's begin with the German steel manufacturing during the war. The two primary types used in the construction of tanks by the Germans were rolled homogenous armour, or RHA, and a surface hardened variant of the former. RHA is formed by hot rolling the steel to homogenise or make uniform the grain structure of the steel, increasing the density and elongating the grain structure in the steel to form long lines to spread the stress impact over a wider area. This steel could then be further hardened by a heat treatment process to form heterogeneous armour. The primary producers of the steel used in World War II were Krupp, United Steelworks and others, each of whom had to send regular samples early on for inspection by the Supreme Commander Land Forces. This armour was then split into seven categories, based on thicknesses, from 5 to 14 mm plate, and then varying thicknesses up to 200 mm thick plate at the extreme end. The intermediary plates of armour, in the 35 to 50 and 50 to 80 mm range, are the most relevant to this discussion, as those involve surface treating to form heterogeneous armour. This would give the material both strong and ductile qualities, not something common in steel production, and by altering the crystal matrix to have a non-linear grain, this could be achieved, but slowly. This surface hardened armour was used notably on Panther, Tiger and Tiger II throughout the war up until late 1944. To create this heterogeneous armour, the Germans used flame hardening techniques done by using oxyacetylene torching over a metal surface. This was not only very time consuming but also used up a lot of gas, so much so that when the ballistic trials were done, these were often done on RHA armour and then the math applied after to calculate any additional effect, something that could have proved disastrous later on. And by flame treating the armour to a depth of 5-10%, to 10%, the metal would form a harder outer shell and softening towards the back to form a more ductile rear plate. To get this effect to work, the steel itself would have a higher than normal carbon count. This would work by having a harder surface than the material making up the armour piercing round on the surface, shattering it, while any penetration would disperse the energy through the steel by a softer inner surface to prevent perforation and spool, in theory. And each German firm was responsible for testing the materials, looking for flaws, pits and cracks, and if found to report them and replace them free of charge. Of course, they were not the only nation to have been looking into this. The UK had long used face hardening plate, but not the heterogeneous armour, as they had discovered that post-hardening 
any weld seams were particularly weak. As carbon-rich metal in the 0.40 to 0.60% level does not like to bond via welding without a lot of heat treatment and cooling, and will still have stresses built into it, likely to shear under any sudden impact. Thus they used riveted armour. This involved taking the steel plate cut to shape and pre-drilled, and then case hardening the metal by heating it in a mix of bone and charcoal, which would infuse the plate with added carbon making it harder. The plate was pre-drilled and cut to shape beforehand. If done afterward, the metal was prone to shattering. This was then cooled and lined up with a corresponding softer endoskeleton of ductile material and the two parts riveted or bolted together. This would help break up any armour-piercing shot when struck horizontally and the soft inner side would absorb the energy in any shot and prevent heavy spooling. But it was not a perfect solution. Firstly, it could lead to the rivets or bolts breaking off inside the vehicle due to the imposing stresses on the two plates, snapping the heads, although this was not as common as people like to believe. The French also realised that such armour, while more effective against solid tip rounds, was less effective against armour-piercing capped rounds, while cast armour was more effective via the latter, and so the French tanks kept the heavy cast plate in their design for a lot longer. This information they also shared with the US, but not the UK. And when we, we discovered this effect, we added a spaced layer to some of the cruisers to strip away the cap before the main armour-piercing round struck the armour. The final problem was that this was only effective to a certain point, after which the corresponding bolts did not scale in a linear way with the required increase in armour thickness, and so became impractical after a certain threshold. After this, the UK switched to cast and welded steel. There was also a further problem with the German method, particularly those steel plates that were to be used on Panther. And for that, we need to look at ships, warships in particular. During the First World War, a lot of the ships had a mix of homogeneous plate with surface-hardened armour on those areas likely to be struck by a broadside at perpendicular angles. While early ships were designed to weather broadsides at relatively close range, as the range increased, the shots became ever more oblique in their angles, and it was found that the face-hardened armour was inferior to homogeneous armour, often allowing the rounds to pass through where regular roll-hardened armour would have prevented this. The Germans themselves were not unaware of this, with homogeneous crop-type armour coming into use for this very reason. So to surmise, the more angled the face-hardened plate was with the aim to deflect shots, the more it can prove incapable of doing so. Now then, back to tanks. So, the German rolled armour had an inherently high carbon content of between 0.26 and 0.53% standard, up to, in some cases, 0.75%, particularly in the middle range of plates, along with high amounts of chrome added, up to 3.2%. So let's take a look at the chemical composition of these plates used in Panther, notably the 35-50mm to plates and the 55-80mm to 80 millimeter plates, so pull up a stool, get your notebooks out, we're going back to school. Starting off with carbon, this is generally considered to be the most important alloying element in steel and can be present up to 2%, although anything over 0.50% will make welding extremely difficult and the metal more brittle, particularly if it's not been tempered. The reports from Panthers found in France showed levels up to 0.63 and as high as 0.75% which it was felt was utterly unsuitable for steel designed to absorb impacts. They had sulphur in there, which is an undesirable impurity in steel rather than an alloying element, uh, with the amounts exceeding 0.05, but generally well within acceptable limits. Next up we got molybdenum. This element is a strong carbide former and usually present in alloy steels in amounts of less than 1%. It increases the hardenability and elevated temperature strength, but also reduces pitting and corrosion. The Germans began to run out of this material from early on, and by 1944 it's no longer found in their metals. This can be seen on surviving German panzers, with those with pitting on the metal surfaces. Then we have manganese. Steel usually contains about 0.30% manganese because it assists in the deoxidization of the steel, and prevents the formation of iron sulphide in inclusions. It also promotes greater strength by increasing the hardenability of steel. However, if you have too much manganese and too much carbon, the steel becomes even more brittle. Both plates and the Panther have three times as much as required at between 1 to 1.2% manganese. 
and we have silicon usually only used in small amounts at 0.20 percent these are present in rolled steel when it's used as a deoxidizer silicon dissolves in iron and tends to strengthen it weld metal usually contains around 0.50 percent silicon the German armour varies with slightly more or considerably less, between 0.32 and 0.80%. Chromium is also a powerful alloying element in steel. It strongly increases the hardenability of steel and markedly improves the corrosion resistance of alloys in oxidising media. It's a lot of this in stainless steel, for example. Its presence in some steels could cause excessive hardness and cracking in and adjacent to welds. The German armour examples had between 1.25% and 2.13% or higher. Nickel is added to steel to increase hardenability. It also improves the toughness and ductility of steel. Even with the increased strength and hardness it brings, it is frequently used to improve the toughness at low temperature. But no amount was found on panthers, but it does appear in Tiger II. Then we have vanadium. The addition of vanadium will increase the hardenability of the steel. It's very effective, so it's added in minute amounts. At amounts greater than 0.05%, there may be a tendency for the steel to become embrittled during thermal stress relief treatments. The German examples were found to be between 0.14 and 0.30%. And finally, phosphorus. It's generally considered to be an undesirable impurity in steel. It's normally found in amounts of 0.04% in most carbon steels. In hardened steels, it may cause a tendency to cause embrittlement. German armour here seems okay with 0.05% or so. So, now we have the makeup of German steel, let's explain the process. First we have to look at the steel to iron spectrum. The lower the carbon content, the more ductile and softer the material. Once carbon gets to around 2% it becomes iron, with cast iron at around 2-4%, pig iron at 6%, and higher than this we get cementite at 6% or greater. For the Germans to get their armour to a heterogeneous level, you have to transform the iron crystals or space lattice to form a new shape via atropy by heating the metal over its threshold. And the more carbon, the lower the threshold, with the aim to get the steel somewhere between ferrite at 0.02% carbon and very soft and austenite at 2% carbon. As this transformation takes place, the grain changes. This forms a laminated structure of layered ferrite and cementite and to draw the carbon via diffusion to one side of the steel plate, it has to be heated and slowly air-cooled on one side. A very time-consuming process. This will give your metal a harder surface and a more ductile inner side. However, this can be cut short by quenching the metal. This will rapidly cool the steel in an oil bath and won't draw the carbon, but will trap it in the steel forming martensite in the steel, distorting the metal lattice. This makes the metal very hard but very brittle, which will make the metal prone to breaking and welds are incredibly difficult to hold. These two metals can be quickly examined by taking an angle grinder to a panther and looking at the spark colour. But oddly enough, many museums and curators get really funny when you turn up to their sites with a grinder to take a look at their panthers. So with the basic sciencey bit out of the way, what did this mean for the panther? Well, quite a lot. As we mentioned above, it was discovered that if the armour was treated correctly and gas treated and cooled, it formed a harder surface and a softer inner side. However, while this might have been effective in vertical armour, it was less effective on sloped armour designed to deflect shots. So this was our first problem. The armour being struck, especially by capped rounds, was not as effective as pure roll hardened armour would have been when angled back around 55 degrees. This steel, when perforated, is identifiable by the softer, butter-like entrance and exit marks and bulges in the steel, with neat scoop marks where the rounds were deflected. However, any metal that was not treated correctly with a high carbon count was even more problematic. This steel had, in several cases, not been tempered by gas torching and retained a high level of hardness, but was also very brittle. Several vehicles examined had not been heat-treated and cooled, and others examined by the Americans had been quenched with oil. And it's known that oil baths were used on the Stug and Jagdpanther hulls at the Brandenburg Eisenberg. While cast armour of a certain thickness will tolerate this tempering, thinner rolled steel will not, and it forms large martensite deposits in the metal, which means that under strain the metal will simply crack open and shatter. The shockwave will propagate until it hits a weld seam.
And sadly, this too the Germans did wrong. In order to get the seam that would work well, they used stainless steel as the bond, which gave the only flex possible. The results from these impacts were catastrophic. As the shot travelled through the armour, the metal around the shot could not compress as quickly as ductile steel, and would split along the crystalline layers in the metal, often for several feet. The inner layer of the armour, even if not perforated, would also spall. As the shock waves hit the void and reflected back, these waves would overlap and then form a tension wave, which could not disperse and would tear a chunk out of the armour. This would then ricochet around the hull, mincing the crew, in a style not too dissimilar to Hesch mechanics. There were, of course, other problems, such as overmatching of armour and temperature changes, but we're going to save those for part two. So where did it all go wrong for the Germans with their tanks? Even the early German vehicles, such as the Panzerkampfwagen 38T, had notoriously brittle armour. When evaluated by the Russians in 1942, along with the British and the Americans, this was also found to be the case for the Panzer III. Their armour was described as over-hardened and brittle by the British and Russian engineers. And this was before the Germans ran into shortages of metals like molybdenum. It may well be that the Germans had less material experience. After suffering defeats in the First World War, and with military metallurgy being highly classified and unshared, they had simply fallen behind. The ironic part is that the German tanks needed to be softer to be tougher, and with their armour plate being so brittle, many vehicles were rendered combat ineffective even by glancing blows which broke away welds, seams and cracked open hulls. Well, if you've got any ideas, let us know below. Thank you for listening. I hope there's something you've learned from this. If you did like these videos, give us a like and subscribe, and uh, don't forget to share it with any of your friends. And until part two, toodle pip.